Hi everyone, welcome to the latest episode in the El Emergente series. My name is Sam Bissett and together with Dominic McCarthy, we are a part of the Australia Latin Emerging Leaders Dialogue. Our organisation seeks to strengthen Australia-Latin America relations through the next generation of young leaders. Today we have the pleasure of interviewing Michael Blake. Uh, Michael uh, works um, in primary industries and he grew up in Patagonia, Argentina. Speaking uh, speaks fluent Spanish and French. And Michael is also the chair for South Australia and the Northern Territory at the Australia Latin America Business Council. He's worked for over 25 years with elders and French multinational chargeurs, operating international trade activities, mainly in the agricultural commodities area. So he has agri-business agri experience in market access, development and intelligence, as well as extension, innovation and transfer of technology in the livestock industries. He travels regularly to the region and he's gladly imparting his knowledge on the agribusiness sector. Michael is also a graduate of the Australian Institute of Company Directors and has a Bachelor of Science in Animal Science, having worked and lives in Australia, New Zealand, the Americas and Europe. Thank you, Michael, for your time to get today and for being a part of this initiative. Though Patagonia and Latin America more generally and Australia are quite different landscapes. Um, what drew you from Patagonia in Argentina to Adelaide in Australia? And I guess, how did your background in agribusiness develop this connection for you? Oh gosh, it's a, it's a long, and, and, and given the grey hairs, it, uh, it, it is a long piece of history. I'm, I'm a, a, a sheep farmer's son uh, from, from Southern Patagonia, not far from the glacier right behind me there in the picture. Um, and I studied my, my animal science in the US looking for extensive agriculture. So that's pastoral agriculture or, or um, uh, harvesting the product off the rangeland, which, he, which are the um, livestock, sheep and cattle. Um, so nothing that's planted, nothing that takes away uh, food stuff from, from other sources. Uh, from there, I um, started working in the international trade of wool. The commodity of wool is something I specialized in, I grew up in. I worked with the French multinational in France, in Europe, into New Zealand, Australia, back to Europe, etc., and linking to Argentina uh, and South America all, all along. So um, my agricultural focus was international trade of one commodity. And then as I moved to elders, that evolved across all livestock commodities and, uh, and specializations, in particular, currently the uh, genetics and genetic material um, as a transfer of technology is something I'm uh, very active in um, personally, yeah. Thanks, Michael. Can you sort of give us a little bit more background on your career? You've worked a lot in the global livestock industry, as you mentioned there, in agriculture. What are some of the projects that you've um, been fortunate to be a part of? Oh, the, 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 the projects have been um, large and small. Uh, the, the main one has been or was, uh, and this goes way back in, in the 80s, um, working as a, as a, as a very uh, new, uh, new graduate in a French multinational working in France and going to Argentina where they, the French firm wanted to develop the plant. They had a platform there which sources wool, the same as they have a platform, had a platform in Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, etc. That project became so challenging in, in Argentina with its um, method of operation, to put it nicely, uh, that I basically um, came back from one of the trips early in my, in my career and uh, sort of said to the boss, well, Monday I'll bring in my resignation because I'm not going to be a part of doing what's going to have to be done to unblock this project. Um, he asked what I wanted to do, and uh, in that process was when I asked to come to Australia, New Zealand, to work more in this wool specialization. Um, and yeah, in 40 minutes, my, my life changed in that he picked up the phone, sent me to New Zealand, then to Australia. Within 18 months of my time here, the funding that was going to go to Argentina came to Australia. We built, so this was really the huge project, we built the largest first stage wool processing plant in the world in Wagga Wagga, New South Wales. Um, through the late 80s, 90s, 2000s. And, um, well, as we headed to the year 2000 and the advent of China, uh, we saw the competitiveness of Australia start falling away. This is a simple process, uh, not high labour, but commodity-driven. Um, commodity so if somebody can do it at two cents a kilo below, you can. 
um, you lose the business. Uh, so the project was basically building all of that. And from there, as the French, in hindsight, they, they, they got it right. They moved early and moved the assets off to China. Uh, and I came to do the same sort of activity with Elders, which at that time had a joint venture called BWK Elders. Again, first stage wood processing, uh, three plants in, in Australia, one in Germany. Um, and again, that over time uh, got shut down given the cost of production. And that's a trade that now happens in China. So some of my colleagues went there. I I didn't. By then, I'd come to Adelaide and chose to stay in Adelaide and moved across to other activities, including um, this freelance um, Blake & Associates agribusiness consulting in this um, red meat and wool, as well as a specific program with the, the state uh, in um, industry development, basically. So it's, yeah, it's all about transfer of technology um, and transfer of technology in the agricultural sphere across to Latin America continues to be a huge, huge opportunity. Great, Michael, thanks. And obviously since moving to Australia, you've become heavily involved in the Australia Latin America Business Council. And drawing on that experience there, what do you see as the greatest opportunity in Australia Latin America trade relations right now? And how could we well, how could both regions capitalize on that? The, the the main thing I see is is this space of transfer of technology. Um, uh, we're, we're never going to sell each other vast amounts of commodity uh, products because we're, we're at least in my sphere of agricultural production. Uh, we're, we're we're competitors in the global market, but we could we do complement each other. Um, so the the opportunity uh, is around that transfer of technology, sharing of technology, more active activities. Um, the greatest opportunity in the in the trade relations goes to um, the the government structures or the industry, the, uh, the government structures linking more closely and early in the process with the industry structures, with the well, the business council. I'm an advocate for it, um, so that we streamline that attempted engagement that a particular country might be trying to do for for their speciality or, or expertise. Um, uh, and, and put it through platforms that are that are operational that have an audience already in Australia. So work with um, the the, um, the government entities that are that are that are in the two sides of the country. It's um, it's it's part of the trade relations uh, answer. The the um, key part of trade relations in a government to government perspective is about continuing to streamline the um, arrangements and biosecurity agreements between each other um, so that we can um, easily and fluidly move um, commodities, decision-making processes, activities from one continent to the other. So um, if we operate in one way in Australia, we're, we're custom, okay, that's the time frame to get the appropriate approvals. Um, I guess we need to do a better job in those relations across the trade so that the the other entity in the other continent can sort of better understand what's expected and um, and then decide if they'll accept the investment or or the activity or or not. Um, we we, uh, we we have great relations with the continents between the continents, but we do find so many parallels of similar things trying to be done in 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 parallel. Um, when I say a bit more streamlining and, and centralizing would 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 help in uh, different aspects it's very it's different uh, one of the main trade opportunities is the 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 young people like yourselves the student cohorts um you know back when I uh, was was I guess leaving the property in in Argentina we all looked to the states to go and study or, or do a master's or do do advanced studies now Latin Americans are much more able to look at Australia, New Zealand and come this way. But other than a couple of countries in Latin America, we, uh, we as uh, Australian universities working in unison haven't done a particular good job across the whole continent where, where you've got over half a billion people and, uh, and, and a lot of potential for, for more students to, to come here and then evolve into this, this relationship. Um, the um, 
the uh, opportunity that's already been secured, and I've got to give credit to Ambassador Villagra Delgado, and we, we all worked in that from Latin America Business Council perspective, was to tie up the sporting links. And so, um, heck, only last, last weekend, the, the captain of Argentina playing for the Canterbury Crusaders in rugby union was the star of the game. That sort of engagement is happening in that sport because Argentina got to be a part of the super rugby here. Um, the work travel visa, which was traditionally known as the Irish Backpackers Visa for fruit picking or other activities, eventually um, got, got accepted to be, to be uh, facilitated into Latin America. Um, those sports and, and, and traveler opportunities and the student opportunity continue to be huge opportunities for, for improving trade, improving relations that will become trade. Um, and, and the trade specifically, I go back to transfer of technology and that's so that services as well. Thanks, Michael. So you've mentioned um, some of those challenges earlier about cost of production in agribusiness and uh, well, biosecurity agreements and things like that. But you've been working across innovation and technology and those areas of development. What are some of those challenges that you've seen across those areas? Oh, well, what, um, challenges in, 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 in ag tech, for example, um, are the, 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 the cost of setting up that software or doing, doing that particular bit of tech. But those that have, I guess, worked with us and linked across to a South American platform that does something similar have found huge benefits of working in a, in a 24-hour clock. I mean, there you are, Dom, at 8 o'clock in the morning. Here we are at 8 o'clock at night. So um, that, that is happening, and that is a huge opportunity to keep, keep building. So, so establish these cooperative uh, structures. Uh, uh, myself, in, in, in what I do with my family, I, I have a brother in the UK and one in Argentina, and between the three of us, we, we turn things around very, very fast when needed because we've got three different time clocks that, that can complement each other. So that, that's one that I've seen as, as an opportunity um, uh, working. Uh, and the, the other is to facilitate, or not facilitate, but um, make a bit more transparent where the, the opportunities of technology need or technology uptake are, um, so that resources from the other continent could be brought into play if, 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 um, if, if that particular issue is not known, rather than go looking for it in in Holland or Israel or the United States, also come to Australia so we can um, see if we can put, pull these things together. In this process, we, we do have a huge amount of very professional uh, Latin American-born PhDs at CSIRO and everywhere else. So, so a lot of that's happening um, naturally, but if from a government-to-government -government perspective, it, it's, it's um, more active, it would help. I guess moving from away from that government to government perspective, how have you seen business develop, business relationships develop and evolve in recent times in the regions? And what do you think the the key is to building strong connections um, between Latin America and Australia in this sense? Well, the key the key looking looking back over the last twenty years that I've been involved in the Latin America Business Council is is the entities that and particularly in resources, or majority in resources, that go look into a new continent when they, when they have a platform onshore uh, here in Australia where they can start the facts finding and the contact making and, and establishing what they're going to do and how, um, that's, that's a huge part of um, the building of the business relationships. Uh, from there, uh, uh, I've seen that then evolve into to where we have 180 at least, um, last count, uh, Australian entities um, now now with platforms in, in, in Latin America, mostly among the, the resource base. So we, we've seen that evolve from, yeah, next to nothing in the, in the 80s um, and in, in a period when um, you know, the Latin America Business Council was, was starting up uh, thanks to the Banco Santander and the initial chairman, Jose Blanco. Um, so huge efforts to provide the links between the two parties 
um, all done voluntarily. So if if um, if these structures just have a little bit more support, then those business relationships can be formed up very quickly because. Um, you know, in my space of agribusiness, I'd know who in Australia I'd recommend you, the Brazilian, to come and talk to for your area of activity. But if you start the fact finding from scratch, you've got that much more work to do. So it's it's that linking to the entities, the platforms, the 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 one, well, the people that are here. Um, there are more and more you know, Latin Americans in Australia, thanks to the work travel visa, thanks to the um, uh, the, the study visas. Um, and sometimes it's it's a bit counterproductive because everyone tries to sort of reinvent the wheel and create their own version of the of the opportunity of the truth of the entity. Um, so that aspect of sort of permanent uh, opportunity is 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 an opportunity. Is, is, yeah, is, is a huge opportunity going forward. But it's evolved enormously from um, having one Aerolinas Argentinas flight coming across the continent. Uh, which was, uh, say, with with a friend of mine, the CEO, and uh, and it was a, a very um, simple structure back in the day, so much so that the plane out of Argentina would leave Buenos Aires, uh, land in Rio Gallegos, which is my town of birth, virtually top up the fuel tanks, something totally against IATA, and then take off over the Antarctic, and you'd sort of... Um, um, yeah, sit there and have that second wine, just not thinking about where exactly we were if something was had to be landed. Um, so that's evolved to to now going back to um, uh, certainly Qantas flying back there, LATAM flying back there, not Aerolinius, and hopefully New Zealand flying back there. So we've gone from nothing to one airline to three. Those sort of evolutions are part of growing the relationships so that we can we can get across there and people can get here. Yeah, great. It's really interesting to see how those business relationships have contributed to a better connected region through, you know, aviation and air travel. Yeah. And so moving forward, I just um, just said the other the other sorry the other sort of evolution is the 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 travel the tourism, uh, which which there are now, yeah, specialist companies that go. Um, I mean, in agriculture, I I get asked to take specialist groups to particular destinations, and that's so much easier, so much workable. Well, now I hope post COVID, it certainly was before COVID, to do than than ten or twenty years ago. Um, so, so the the visas, the the access to the countries, the the travel in and out is um, is much more streamlined. Always with the complication though that that we are in a very different time frame, and so you need to work with a local platform ju- uh, just in case things go wrong. So it's all it's all a huge opportunity. But when it's structured um, correctly, in case something goes wrong, yeah, I think the tourism opportunities are really exciting, and certainly from our organisation's perspective, we're wanting to encourage more young Australians to travel there, study there, and, and consider Latin America. So, moving uh, forward into the future, what do you think are the main economic factors that are going to influence um, business, international business between Australia and Latin America, and what's your view on the the future? Um, for the two regions in in business and business development. Um, well, huge huge opportunity. Uh, um, uh, the 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 influencing the the Australian American interactions across each other uh, is now a, a real opportunity to build on what's already in place. Um, I'm picking on, for example, do you know what the greatest import to Australia from Argentina is? Uh, the the biggest import from Argentina, other the, than a few of us um, old Argies, is the Amarok Ute, the 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 truck. So the ability uh, now for for Latin American countries to be part of that supply chain, which we have for too long looked only north south, um, and, and uh, been a net importer of stuff made in China, uh, that I think there is a huge um, opportunity for us to look left and right a bit more actively. Um, and I'm not highlighting the left, but if we look right across the Pacific to South America, the opportunity to build these working relationships, that's, that, that could be a cheaper cost of production continent, Volkswagen or Toyota, whoever in this case of automotive have their plants there. Well, let's work on establishing better shipping connectivity and, and use that source of trade more actively. Um, because it, it works. It's there. Um, it's, say it's quickly become the biggest, uh, 
import from a country that um, uh, that that normally really shipped very little to uh, to Australia. Um, the the um, the economic factors, yeah, um, uh, will 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 vary with the economic times of each each country, but we need to continue working on the market access and streamlining all of that um, all of that simplification. You really can't have uh, you know countries over there saying yes, yes, we can we can import um, you know a live animal worth tens of thousands of dollars. And then you find that it lands in Santiago in transit to Argentina or Uruguay, and uh, the Chileans have found some last-minute complication, and, and so you know there's an animal stranded at the airport. You, we can't we can't have that, um, and that's only an exceptional case. Normally, it flows directly, especially when the flights are, are direct, um, and that's rare. It's now more more genetic material and other things. My point is, all of those regulatory things need to continue to be. Streamlined, simplified, and and and, and made easier, um, so that so that trade happens more easily. Uh, there is that huge opportunity, as I said earlier, to use the manufacturer, the expertise, or or or, or the um, uh, yeah, say the experts from that continent to work with us in a twenty-four hour clock in some aspects, um, and the offshoring doesn't have to go to um, you know to India or. or um, or countries in, in Asia, it can come here. The next item to, to clearly mention, and um, unfortunately it comes to mind with the, with the, um, the, um, the processing of uh, meat, but we, we have in Australia a, a labor challenge, a labor shortage of people are prepared to, to do that sort of work. Um, whether it's all agricultural work, shearing, um, working in the yards or, or, or processing meat, that's an expertise that exists in Latin America. There could be huge programs that could facilitate that sort of labor coming, as well as the skill migration and uh, and the work travel visas. So again, we we maybe have an application Australia as a nation towards the Pacific, in in some ways, but um, the the agricultural visa that's been talked about. Um, would be better off using labor that knows what they're doing in, in at least in my space of activity in the livestock space than than people that don't. Thanks, Michael. I I really liked what you said about looking left and right, maybe rather than looking north and south so much. Um, I think your reflections in general on the business opportunities and connections across the two regions have been very insightful and you've definitely offered a positive outlook for the future of, of our two regions. Um, before we finish up today, is there anything else you'd like to say or a message you'd like to leave our viewers with um, before we finish? No, I'd, I'd like to compliment you for, for pulling this together and, and um, setting up this structure and, uh, and catching us uh, and, and in, 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 in invite you to get involved and get along to some of those Latin America Business Council activities, or if you come to South Australia, we'll, we'll link you in with the Latin American Society of South Australia. So there are other platforms that, that that help. The language, for example, the language schools are something we do in South Australia uh, amateurishly, but if we could complement each other, there'd, there'd be so much uh, possible. And then at a much higher level, we, we need to do no more than just look um, at some of the headline investments with Twiggy Forest uh, working in, in green hydrogen with, with um, other activities that are moving across there. So the, the opportunities are there, the links are there. And my final comment was I would, I would leave with all um, Australian entities that attempt to work in, in other continents, not, not just Latin America, but certainly Latin America, to employ or to have people in your teams like yourselves, all of you that speak the language and understand a bit the culture is always a huge advantage. And Australia now have that. They, they now have, we now have enough um, sons of or, or Latin American um, uh, young professionals that can join corporates and, and help that corporate find their feet in Latin America. Certainly, yes. Well, thank you once again, Michael, uh, for joining us today and imparting your knowledge and thoughts. And we certainly look forward to seeing that um, the relationships and the, the business opportunities continue to strengthen across the two regions. And uh, I think, yeah, as you mentioned, the, the future is positive and there's lots of opportunities there for, for collaboration. 
it's certainly an aspect of co collaboration that I always try to do from from my perspective with with associates on particular pieces of work that I can help with, uh, and that's always um, uh, always a very workable uh, option as long as we can find the the transport and the funding and all of the things that need need to make it work. But it's it's an ongoing and a great uh, transfer of technology to Latin America and back. Thanks, Michael. And, uh, and to everyone, everyone watching, thank you and stay tuned for more inspiring and insightful discussions with Australian and Latin American leaders in our El Emergente series. Goodbye. Muchas gracias, Sam and Dom. Gracias. Thank you.